Well, good morning. Uh, again, I'm Joanne Gear from the Biopharma Research Council. Uh, we are an association for scientists across all the different silos of biomedical research. So that includes industry, academia, nonprofit, government, and suppliers and their teams. And our whole mission is about helping scientists share knowledge, talk to each other, find fresh collaborations and partnerships. Uh, we reach about uh, more than 10,000 researchers these days. I'm going to share with you just a few things that are coming up. Uh, in July, we're doing a program in Princeton on cybersecurity for connected devices. And this is looking at everything from uh, implanted devices like pacemakers and uh, insulin pumps and such uh, through to wearables, including Fitbits and clothing and so on. Uh, in August, we have a virtual symposium that you will be right here on this same channel um, on point of care diagnostics. In October, we'll be in uh, at Kane University uh, at their Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship for an update on microbiome research. In uh, uh, also in October, we go to North Carolina where we have are going for our fifth year of the Triangle Biotech Research Symposium, and this year the theme is on data drugs diagnostics. I'm sensing a theme, perhaps. Uh, then in November, back in New Jersey, we're doing a program on companion diagnostics, and in November on uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing. I'm just going to say a little bit more about that, and then we'll get uh, moving on. Uh, we are celebrating in this program, which is a full day in central New Jersey, uh, to really celebrate the complexity of dealing with manufacturing and pharmaceutical industry. I'm just going to share with you a couple of notes. Uh, we just did a survey of 140 uh, drug development professionals, so this is uh, all on the research side. And we asked them, in your experience, when do discussions about manufacturing begin? 10% of them says they happen all the way through from discovery right through to release. 25% uh, say it happens in discovery. 30% say it happens in the preclinical. And then uh, sort of about 3% during phase one. And then it's lower numbers because obviously it has to begin very, very early. Uh, so we're going to be having a really nice range of uh, programs, training programs, and so on that day. And I invite everyone here to think about getting involved with any of our programs. Um, we are uh, largely driven by the interests of our community. So uh, if you have something you'd like to chat about, feel free to be in touch. That's my phone number at the bottom of the screen. Um, the, uh, today's program will be recorded, and the slides will be made available as well. It takes a couple of days, and then we'll send out an email to let you know they're available. Uh, you can enter questions in the question box at any time. We will take all the questions after our speaker, so we'll have a real opportunity for dialogue. But feel free to enter at any time. And if it's about a specific slide, it's a little helpful if you can identify which slide. I'm going to hand things over now to Niha Nigam who has been working with us on this series and doing a fantastic job. Niha? Thank you, Joanne, and good morning, and welcome, everybody, to this session. Um, um, I associated with BRC as a young investigator, and I have been primarily helping BRC um, organize this webinar series. So with that, I'd also like to mention that we have um, a series, a couple of them coming up in July, August, and in September. So we'd love for you to join us at that time, too. And um, then I'd like to introduce today's speakers and a little bit about um, um, why we are so interested in, in listening to them. So uh, our speakers today are from Mount Sinai Innovation Partners and um, um, they are experts in business management and development and uh, they will discuss the specific Blue Mountain technologies and the strategies that they use at this institute um, to commercialize the discoveries and innovations for better healthcare products and services for patients and in general consumers um, who need them. Blue Mountain Technologies is an internal business unit which is managed by Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, um, again responsible for the commercialization. We have with us today Felipe who is the director of the Blue Mountain Technologies and um, um, is involved primarily in these commercialization efforts. Um, he previously worked um, in several uh, uh, positions in, in, um, in uh, 
Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute and also at Beckton Dickinson. Um, he previously did his postdoc and PhD. Um, his PhD was in PhD, uh, biochemistry from McGill University and um, his bachelor's um, was from University of Maryland and he also has an MBA from University of California, San Diego. We also have with us Chris Friends who is a business development manager also at Blue Mountain Technologies. Um, in addition to helping with the, with the work at, at Blue Mountain Technologies, he also supports internal development and licensing in digital health space. He was also a postdoc fellow at the Icon School of Medicine and also holds a PhD in Neurobiology from Boston University and a BA also from Boston University. So without further ado, we'd like to deep dive into learning more about um, Blue Mountain Technologies in general and also a little bit about um, what Felipe and Chris and Bill want to share with us today. So over to Felipe. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Felipe Arujo. Uh, yeah, here with my colleagues Chris Friends and Bill Chang. Uh, today, as Niha mentioned, thank you very much for the introduction for the kind introduction. We're going to talk about uh, Blue Mountain Technologies. Um, as she mentioned, this is a division within uh, Mount Sinai uh, Innovation Partners. Uh, and you already sort of gave a, an, an introduction about, uh, about ourselves, but uh, just to uh, speak a little bit more, I uh, started my business development career at the Burnham Institute, which is now the Sanford Burnham Institute. Um, then I uh, transitioned to Beckton Dickinson. I spent uh, about three and a half years uh, in the business development group and, and uh, in OEM. Um, and for the past four and a half years, uh, I've been here at Mount Sinai directing Blue Mountain Technologies. Um, actually, I'm the first employer together with, with Bill uh, in Blue Mountain. This was a group that was created four and a half years ago. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris Friends now. Uh, thanks, Felipe. Uh, thanks, Niha and Joanne. Uh, my name is Christopher Friends. I'm a business development manager. Uh, I am often asked how I got into this, so I figured I would give just a little bit of a background. Uh, I started a BA in marine science at Boston University. I had an interest in marine science because I had an interest in shark electrophysiology. Um, I continued that into my PhD uh, there uh, in Woods Hole. And graduating from that neurobiology program, I decided that I wanted to have a little bit more of a clinical slant, so I had applied to some po uh, postdoctoral programs and started at Mount Sinai. Uh, in the neurology department there. Uh, there, uh, instead of uh, EFIS, focus more on genetic engineering um, and model building uh, for movement disorders. And while I was there, I kind of, you know, felt more pulled towards the business side uh, than the bench side of science. So I started to, to ask around and discovered Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, so the existence of the tech transfer office here, and just made a few phone calls, waited a few months, uh, finally got in, had an interview, and ended up by interning for a couple of months within the office, you know, really learning how this business is run from the inside. Uh, after a few months then uh, being hired on to um, a position uh, which I am currently at today. So, um, Bill? Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Um, anyway, um, my name is Bill Chang and I'm a business development consultant. Um, I've been consulting with the Mount Sinai office since 2006. Um, I have eight plus years in university business development uh, prior to doing business development, I have a technical background. I've worked in industry and also a couple of startup companies. I worked for a company called Sonoff Corporation in Princeton. And for those who don't know, Sonoff Corporation used to be called the RCA Central Research Laboratory. Um, and that, when I joined, the business model was to create technology to, uh, to actually spin off into startup companies. Uh, so I was the technical founder of a drug discovery uh, startup and also uh, was the technical lead in three other startups in the life sciences and in medical devices. Um, so what I will do is, Felipe, next slide, please. And what I'll do is, I, I think a good place to start is just to give a very general overview of the Mount Sinai health system. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, for, for the longest time, Mount Sinai uh, was basically the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and also the Mount Sinai Hospital. 
but in the last couple of years, there's been a consolidation. So now the Mount Sinai Health System actually consists of seven hospitals in New York City. Uh, for instance, now it's uh, Beth Israel Hospital is now called Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Um, the, and we have Mount Sinai Queens, Mount Sinai Brooklyn, Mount Sinai St. Luke's, uh, Mount Sinai West, which used to be called uh, Roosevelt Hospital, and also Mount Sinai New York Ear and, uh, and, and I, uh, in addition to the main hospital on 96th Street. And to your left is just some statistics on where we are, you know, when it comes to uh, rankings and um, research funding and also ranking in certain departments. Uh, we are, you know, pretty, we've done pretty well when it comes to getting research money for, for each, uh, from each research rank fourth. Uh, we also do pretty well in NIH funding. We're considered one of the top medical schools um, in North America. Um, af after the consolidation, we have now over 6,000 physicians and 2 million outfit outpatient visits. And what is unique about the Mount Sinai system after the consolidation of these hospitals is, is that we have a very diverse group of patients, and that is very unique uh, in the United States. Um, to the right, I put down some metrics when it comes to Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. And Mount Sinai Innovation Partners is the business development arm of the Mount Sinai Medical System, uh, of the Mount Sinai Health System. And just to give you some, again, more metrics, just a, a quick overview before I get into more detail, um, we handle, in 2015, over 100 disclosures. These are uh, technical inventions that, we, that comes into our office. Uh, we have done over 50 licenses and option agreements. These are licenses that actually bring in revenue, and last year it accounted for $58 million in revenue. Um, we have over 200 new patent filings, and we have, in addition to licenses, we've also do a lot of uh, sponsored research agreements. And these are companies that come to us and want to fund some of our research. Um, 2015, we did over 100 of those, which accounted for over $22 million in revenue. And and then there's a line called MTAs and CDAs, and for those who don't know what these are, MTA stands for Material Transfer Agreements. These are agreements where researchers may send samples to each other uh, when they collaborate on a research. Uh, we need to put agreements in place just to make sure that the materials are handled properly. And CDAs are what is called Confidential Disclosure Agreements. These also go by NDAs. Um, confidential disclosure agreements basically are agreements where if we're talking to a company um, or anybody outside of Mount Sinai, in fact, and we have a chance of exchanging proprietary information, these agreements basically protects uh, the proprietary nature of the discussion. And 2015, we've done more than a thousand of those combined. So that kind of gives you some feel as to uh, the activity that our office handles. Next slide, please. So what is Mount Sinai Innovation Partners? Um, again, what I said, alluded to, was that it is the business development arm of the Mount Sinai Health System. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is that we are the interface between our research and industry, and our prime directive is to bring innovation that comes from our researchers, from, that comes from our doctors, and help a better patient outcome, to benefit a society. That is, that is our prime directive. Uh, in return, when we have these partnerships with industry, uh, we also get an equitable return for these inventions. So, you know, the dollar sign goes back to the, to the school and that cycles into more innovation, more research, more funding uh, to do more things. At the bottom of this slide, I listed some of the activities that our office does and I just want to go through very quickly some details of what they mean. Technology scouting, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what inventions there are in Mount Sinai. Uh, and this involves uh, in faculty engagement. We partner with faculty to learn about their research, to encourage them to uh, submit disclosures to us so that we can figure out whether there is something proprietary and there is something inventive and there, whether there is something commercial. Um, if not, you know, we give them feedback. Um, so that 
is an activity that, 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 that is very important for us. Now, once we get an, an invention, the next step is called technology evaluation. And what this means is that when we have an invention, we need to figure out, you know, not just whether it's patentable, but whether there's a commercial opportunity. So patents, you know, in and of itself uh, won't make any money. But, you know, we don't want to invest in a patent that have absolutely no commercial impact. So what we do is that we assess whether an invention has a commercial opportunity and also if it does, whether the, invent, the invention should be patented uh, or not. Not all inventions should be patented. For example, uh, software predominantly, this is not to say that we don't patent software, but predominantly software is a very tricky thing to patent. And usually when it comes to protection, we usually go with copyright. Um, whereas something like a therapeutic, uh, something where you could define, you know, in, a, in, in chemistry where you could, um, you know, not just define it, but also enforce the patent, that would be something that we would definitely look into patenting. So, and that moves us to, again, the third thing, which is patenting. Um, when we decide to do a patent, uh, we engage with patent attorneys, but also we also spend a lot of time managing the patent portfolio. Uh, because we want to get claims in the patent that have commercial impact. Um, once we invested in that, we spend a lot of energy marketing. And there are many ways that we do marketing. We do it on the website. Um, if you go into the MSIP website, there are descriptions of inventions that are available for um, partnership. Uh, but in addition to that, we go into events where we try to meet, uh, meet and engage uh, venture capitalist firms, we have contacts over in, in pharmaceutical companies, we have contacts in biotech companies, uh, all of those uh, is part of marketing. We also have something called VC Day, Pharma Day, where we invite representatives of pharmaceutical companies and we have an event where uh, we present and showcase some of the best, most uh, mature of the, of the inventions in our portfolio. Now, once we actually engage in a partnership, uh, we have enabling agreements. The MTAs and the CDAs are part of these agreements, um, and then we have other ones that are just more collaborative research agreements that basically try to drive inventions. Licensing and partnership, these are agreements and partnerships where uh, we do an actual commercial deal that brings in revenue. And the reason why this is important is because our office actually structure the license. Not all technologies have the same structure. So for instance, for therapeutic, uh, we normally have in addition to um, you know, uh, upfronts and, and annual uh, maintenance, we may put in some milestones because every time, like let's say a therapeutic compound goes into clinical trials and passes a clinical trial, the value of that asset increases. And when that value of that asset increases, we think that Mount Sinai should be rewarded for that. So as opposed to other licenses for, and um, Chris and Felipe will go into more detail uh, on that, like research reagents, those are more sim generally more simple licenses like antibodies. That would be more just uh, in terms of royalties, percentage of net sales as opposed to milestones. Uh, post deal compliance. In this area, what we're doing is that once a deal is signed, we want to make sure that everything in that deal is, um, is, is going forward. So for instance, if there's a milestone payment, we have a division that makes sure that that is paid. If there's a diligence report, this is when we license it to somebody, we just want to get reports back that they are actually putting resources in to make it into a commercial product those reports need to be delivered and our compliance uh, people make sure that happens. And lastly, and certainly not least, um, we have an education component. So for instance, I would say that uh, the webinar here that we're doing falls under that category. Um, in addition to something like this, we also have an internship program. Uh, this internship program is unique in the sense that uh, we not only accept applicants from Mount Sinai, but also these schools in New York. So we have interns that come into our office from Columbia, from Rockefeller, from NYU, 
who wants to learn more about the business side of technology. And uh, what we do is really we, we loop them into some of the activities that we do, like doing um, technology assessment, where we have to really figure out from searches, uh, whether there's a commercial opportunity or it's a parent patentable technology, so forth and so on. That way they get a pretty good feel about what we do and that would impact their career choice. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick summary of some of the Mount Sinai successes I just want to highlight. So in the past, we have a success in therapeutics. This is called Fabrazyme. Uh, it's marketed by Genzyme. It is the first treatment for an orphan disease called Fabry's disease. Uh, we also have something called Flumis, which is uh, marketed by uh, Metamune. This is a preventive for flu, it's a nasal, nasal spray. In the diagnostic area, we have something based on the recombinant human tissue factor marketed by Siemens and Roche. Uh, this is to monitor uh, um, uh, clotting in, in blood. Uh, um, in the medical device category, we have a number of those, uh, but you know we want to highlight it with a Physio 2, which is a mitral valve re repair ring for uh, uh, for cardio. And research reagents, we have an antibody in the in um, the Alpha Beta 42 antibody uh, to study Alzheimer's research. So those are some of the highlights. Uh, we have a couple more. And with that, I want to switch this presentation over to Felipe, where you could dive deeper into Blue Mountain. Thank you, Bill. Um, so as I mentioned in my very first slide, um, in 2012, Mount Sinai created this new division called Blue Mountain Technology within uh, Innovation Partners. Uh, and the idea was to form this group to focus exclusively on four asset categories, uh, diagnostics, devices, digital health, um, and research tools. And by default, uh, the consequence is that the rest of the BD team uh, can then focus exclusively on therapeutics. And I'll explain a little bit more, uh, more about the rationale for, uh, for this uh, division. So traditionally, um, tech transfer offices uh, are organized uh, by um, where, where the BD team or the licensing group will focus on all asset card categories within a particular department. So they'll be divided essentially by departments. Um, but there's no specialization uh, within, uh, within industry. So essentially, a particular BD person has to be well-versed uh, in therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, digital health, research tools, uh, and everything that comes out of a, of a, of a health system. Uh, so there's no real specialization. On the other hand, uh, we have how our, our office is, uh, is organized, which is under the Blue Mountain team, uh, we are responsible for the commercialization of diagnostics, devices, digital health, and research tools. And then the other, uh, the, the, uh, the remainder part of the BD team focuses on therapeutics. Um, and, you know, why is this important? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus, I'll switch to the next slide. Um, the reason why that's important is because each one of these categories um, uh, has their own intricacies, their own challenges, um, you know, related to intellectual property, regulatory differences, investment necessary to take a product to the market. So, for example, if you take a research product, uh, the way that a research product is this close to our office is pretty close to how it's going to be commercialized by a company. Within a short period of time, uh, you know, you can have a license and let's say in six months the product is actually being sold. There's no, uh, you know, most of the times there are no regulatory approvals necessary. Um, but if you take a diagnostic, for example, you know, it's quite different and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, we'll focus in each asset category. Um, but that allows the group to actually become specialized uh, in, in each category. We actually further specialize in, in, in this category, so um, I focus mostly on diagnostics, Chris focuses mostly on, on digital health, uh, on devices, I'm sorry. Uh, Bill and Chris share the responsibility with digital health and research tools, we all kind of touch it a little bit. Of course, there's some overlap, um, but, but we further specialize. And uh, you know, the benefit of that is also is that you can imagine that within each uh, industrial sector, 
there's also a set of uh, relationships that you have to foster, uh, and, and these take time to manage. Um, so if you have a situation where in the traditional structure, everybody has to worry about every, uh, every uh, industry sector. Um, whereas under the Blue Mountain structure, we have this uh, specialization. So switching gears specifically now on, on diagnostics, just to give an example, um, you know, this is an asset category that is very diverse. It has its own challenges. Um, you know, the, the, the disclosures that we get in our office, uh, they, uh, they can be, for example, biomarkers as an, as an example of a biomarker. It can be an antibody that may start as a research tool, uh, but it may be used by a pathology, uh, a pathology group, and, uh, and this pathology group may demonstrate that the antibody uh, can distinguish a disease state from a normal state, uh, in which case, uh, you know, the, the antibody can be used um, uh, in a diagnostic situation. Um, recently, we have, we've seen an increase uh, in uh, disclosures related to signatures, so just to give you an example, uh, we have a patent, where we're with patent pending, uh, on a 53 gene panel that is a prognostic for the reoccurrence of melanoma. Um, and uh, we also have some platform technologies that are disclosed under the diagnostic category. So for example, we have a food allergy uh, diagnostic platform that is based on, on, on little peptides. Um, now, uh, you know, there have been some recent uh, trends in, uh, in, uh, in diagnostics that we have to consider. Just to give you an example, there are recent court decisions, Supreme Court decisions that have made patenting decisions uh, more challenging, so specifically uh, uh, Myriad and Prometheus. So Myriad um, uh, relates to uh, gene patents, um, and so it's the eligible subject matter, um, and so this has made an impact on our DNA patents. You know, we've had in the past, for example, uh, our geneticist, um, just to give you one example, on Noonan syndrome, if you had a particular mutation on the Noonan's gene, um, you know, by sequencing you find if a patient has that, by carrier screen analysis you find if a, if a patient has that disease or not, and we would patent that. Nowadays it's become a little bit more challenging to have that patent. It's not to say that we don't patent genes, but usually they, for example, can be signatures. Um, but our IP attorneys uh, have, you know, have become more sophisticated in, in drafting claims, and we have to be, have a clearer picture of the commercial opportunity. Likewise, with Prometheus, uh, this has had a bigger impact on our antibody patents um, because of eligible subject matter. They're considered natural substances. But again, it doesn't mean that we don't file patents on antibodies if they are, not if they're research tools, uh, but if they're diagnostics and the commercial opportunity is large enough or if they're certainly if they're therapeutics, uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, if it's an antibody that you're generating uh, for specific use, they're not really considered uh, natural substances. But again, it's something that uh, we, pay, we pay close attention to. Other considerations that are specific for diagnostics, um, you have to consider if the commercial approach is going to be uh, through a clear certification, so these are uh, uh, this is regulation that is uh, 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 managed by by each and every state. Uh, it's not by the federal government, so it's not by the FDA. Uh, in which case, these are centralized labs uh, that have standard uh, techniques. So, for example, sequencing or uh, or immunohistochemistry. Uh, if you're going to perform that test under a centralized lab, and it is a lab dev developed test, then the FDA uh, does not yet regulate it. They, there's been talks in the industry about the FDA wanting to regulate that. Uh, but if you want to sell a kit across state lines, then you need to have FDA approval. And again, it's something challenging. And uh, you know, it's important for you to consider that because of the investment necessary in some of these activities. Um, and then lastly, and certainly not least with regards to this, is reimbursement. Again, um, if you're going to go to a doctor's office and they're going to tell you to have a diagnostic, uh, first of all, you have to actually show that the diagnostic is useful. So you have to, before getting the specific code, you have to show, you have to perform clinical utility studies. Um, and if you want to be reimbursed at a premium, you, you usually you want to get your specific CPT code for that particular technology. That stands for current procedural technologies, which, again, the insurance companies will, uh, uh, will utilize to pay, to reimburse uh, a physician when they are um, administering that diagnostic test. So, um, so I'm going to turn off now. Turn over to uh, to Chris, who's going to talk about research tools.
I'll move back one slide. We'll start Hang with on. devices. Oh, devices, okay, sorry. Great. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Felipe. Um, okay, so uh, devices, medical devices. So what are we thinking about here? So this is typically surgical equipment, um, scalpels, gowns, uh, all sorts of tools that can be useful in surgery. Um, could be diagnostic devices uh, or imaging equipment. So these, you know, could be different things that would go into a scanner or used in x-rays to better diagnose a particular disease. Uh, and why we separate this is that the path to market is a bit different. In fact, it's threefold. So it can be your medical device, either a class one device, which you just have to register it. So this is like a glove and a gown, something that's very simple and can't cause patient harm. Or it could be a, a class two device, which is subject to 510K uh, clearance. In this case, it's a, usually an iterative uh, improvement on an existing device. You need to show substantial equivalence to a predicate device that's out there. Um, and then the highest bar is a class three device, which would be subject to pre-market authorization that would require clinical trials, um, extensive development and testing. Uh, and funding to push forward. So um, what we've seen in the last you know, five years or so is a pretty big uh, consolidation in the market, uh, in, in the device space. So you've had the Covidian Medtronic mergers, you've had Stryker, Mako mergers, Zimmer Biomet. So the bigger companies are consolidating. And when you go to pitch um, some devices to them or device ideas to them, uh, unfortunately, they just don't have a big enough external R&D budget uh, to entertain those projects. Um, and I liken this uh, as the opposite of the pharma industry. Um, pharma has sort of gotten rid or shed a lot of its internal R&D and is looking to outsource some of its discovery uh, to academic partners. So in the device space, we're not quite there yet. I hope to see a change in the next five to 10 years um, as I think it would be beneficial to both parties. But as it stands now, they prefer to see uh, you know, us uh, and other smaller groups go out there and prototype their device, make an MVP, do their initial studies, uh, get the 510K clearance, form a company, uh, get a couple million in sales, and then come back to them, and then they're very open to uh, acquiring that company. So if you have customers and you have a revenue stream, then that's a much easier proposition for them to handle. Um, so uh, in realizing that, what we did is uh, we went out and uh, applied for and received a $5 million grant from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, and this, this money essentially went towards the formation of Mount Sinai Institute of Technology. This is a degree granting program uh, within Mount Sinai. Uh, our, the degree would be design, technology, and entrepreneurship. Uh, and this was owning up to the fact that a lot of academic researchers aren't going to go on to become full academic professors. And there are a lot of other options uh, in you know, the scientific space, such as entrepreneurship uh, and building uh, these devices. So part of that grant helped us establish the rapid prototyping facility. So this is a facility that we have within Mount Sinai that's full of uh, CAD design equipment, 3D scanners, CNC milling, profilometers, a whole bunch of tools that allow us to create a prototype and do some initial testing here. Now that gets us so far. The, the next step that we did is establish what's called the PAIR program here. And that stands for Project Accelerator for Innovative Research. And this is a program that we established because we realized that as an academic medical center, we have certain limitations in the engineering side. So we partnered with other engineering schools such as CCNY, Cooper Union, Stevens Institute of Technology, NYU Polytech, uh, and RPI. We could leverage some of their senior design teams uh, or master's students in their programs with our clinical expertise in a mutually beneficial way to get projects moved forward. And through the PAIR program, we've had three, three or four patent applications now, and through the rapid prototyping facility, um, have one uh, patent application and more on the way. So we see this as a, as a success. There are some IP considerations uh, that we have to consider also in the space. Uh, device space is very crowded. So um, as I said before, a lot of the new devices are just um, small changes on existing devices. So um, some devices require patent protection. Um, some don't. 
some require a pretty extensive investment. And this kind of hits upon another limitation that we have as an academic center, which is that if we have an innovative device, you know, we have to have serious conversations internally about how, how big to dig that moat around that device. So a company that has uh, pretty deep pockets would not have a problem filing 20 patent applications and trying to build some protection around a device idea and moving it forward. So for us, uh, that's pretty expensive. So you know we have to think about that. But we do file on the things that we think are going to be useful um, and would benefit the patients. Uh, next slide, Felipe. Uh, so next is uh, research tools. So these are antibodies, animal models, um, cell lines, other reagents, tool compounds, and methods. Um, so with these, we take a portfolio approach. So we try to do relatively high transaction volume, you know, understanding that each one is likely, you know, your traditional research use antibody is not going to return a ton of money, but if we can do a thousand of those, then that money starts to become pretty substantial. Um, so in order to do so, you know, we license them out relatively non-exclusively to multiple partners, try to get these tools out there. Uh, we do have a few exclusive deals in this space. So there could be an exclusive distribution agreement um, or just giving a product to one particular company that's going to own that, that space in the market. Um, and in doing so, in trying to get these tools out there, we kind of have a three-tiered approach. So first, uh, we've built you know, really good relationships with uh, preferred commercial partners, those being the EMDs, Thermo, Life Sciences, BD. Now, the second tier to that would be advertising through our own site. So the bigger players like to see that those tools have been published. If those tools are published, there's marketing people will want them. Um, if they haven't been published yet, we can still advertise for them on our site. Uh, and in addition, the third tier is that we've partnered with uh, other companies. So Symbio uh, is one example uh, out of MRC in the UK, uh, and then Carafast uh, out of Boston. So these are, are two sites that we can list our reagents and give us better exposure to commercial partners. Uh, with these research tools, it's a pretty easy path to market. Um, usually, there's no patent costs, uh, relatively little internal development costs, and they're often not subject to regulatory approval. Uh, and one really good thing about the research tools in that maybe the, some of the tools that you're working on, they, they may not return a lot, but they offer you the opportunity to interact with multiple investigators. And this is very helpful in kind of getting out of the building, getting to those researchers, and being able to explain to them better what our office does and how we can best support them, and then have conversations about public disclosure, uh, when to disclose to our office, and how we can help them with some of their uh, research programs, uh, or at least approaches. So, so that's sort of like an unsung benefit. Um, of the research tool space. And then in addition to that, next slide, Felipe. So normally there's a low return on, on these investments, but there are research tools out there that have provided substantial uh, revenue return to institutions. So we've had antibodies return over $100,000 a year uh, or more. Um, Columbia has a very famous method for co-transfection that's returned thousandfold more than that. Um, so you can have real big winners uh, in this space. So I think it's, it's something that's really important to uh, not discard uh, and pay attention to. Uh, also, these research antibodies can transition into diagnostic antibodies. So we have a good example of one here that we're currently working on with a diagnostics company where we created an antibody that appears to be you know, best in market for the detection of this particular antigen. So we're working with the company on patent applications and, and getting that out there. And the last one uh, pertains to something that, that has become a lot more important now as cell-based therapies have become more in vogue. So the idea of this is not new. Um, however, getting these technologies into clinical trials uh, has been more successful now than it has been in the past. So we've had some stem cell methods and tools that start out as research tools and are now going into screenings, uh, screening tools, so release assays, things like that, uh, or directly into cell-based therapies. Uh, next slide. Okay, a couple of words on digital health. So Bill and I uh, lead the digital health efforts here. 
Wow, these are these are assets that you consider mostly, you know, apps. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, I have an app for this, so yes, that that's one portion of it. Um, it's also healthcare IT. So these are systems uh, that can be put in place, uh, integrated within the, the healthcare system to increase billing and you know documentation quality, things like that, as well as computational methods. So leveraging big data expertise, analyzing large volumes of genetic data to try to come up with diagnostic or prognostic tools uh, for moving forward. So uh, for us, this is a relatively new market. Um, the, the, path to validity, uh, the path to market here is a little murky. So uh, right now, you know, there's validation through clinical trials. Some of these apps and tools don't require uh, validation, so through clinical trials. However, if you do have that, it's much easier for um, a, a licensing entity or investors to get on board. And the FDA regulatory position right now is starting to clear up, but it's still very murky. So if you go to the FDA site, they actually have a tool, uh, sort of like a decision tree, where you go in and ask you some questions about what the app does or what your software does, and leads you down to an answer of whether you they think that you do or don't need FDA regulatory approval. Um, and as Felipe had said, there are IP issues here. So difficult to protect with patents. Yes, we do file some patents. These are methods of using algorithms to get to the end or less popularly the business method patent that's been floating around. But yeah, these are usually uh, just protected by copyright and trademark. So we move on from there. Um, so yeah, so the last thing I wanted to touch on is startups. So these tools, uh, devices, diagnostics, et cetera, and digital uh, health, they don't have to be licensed. Some of them are good opportunities for um, spin-outs or startups from the institution. And these are four just examples of things that we're starting up now. Uh, in the research tool space, uh, Tacitus Therapeutics, so this is a proprietary stem cell technology uh, for the expansion of um, stem cells. Uh, these are cord blood stem cells. and this could be used as a research tool, uh, but also can be used in hematological malignancies for expedited replacement of white blood cells and platelets. In the diagnostic uh, space, we have a company that we're forming called Arc Bioanalytics, and they analyze bone, and they analyze bone and they can tell the environmental exposure, so what kind of metals and organic compounds you've been exposed to uh, over your lifetime. In the uh, medical devices space, we have a company that we're licensing to now. It's a startup company called Cardia Sciences. Uh, and they do hemodynamic monitoring uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation patients. This would be for stratification of who'd be at risk or not at risk during cardiac procedures. Uh, we also have uh, another company called Monogram Arthroplasty that we're working with. Uh, they do specialized custom implants. Um, and then finally, in the digital health space, uh, we have Responsive Health, uh, which is a company that's, that's doing um, clinically validated um, app, like a marketplace for clinically validated apps uh, and other consulting services. So now I'd like to pass it back on to Felipe who can talk about uh, the outcomes of this approach at MSIP. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, you know, uh, here are some general outcomes of, uh, of having created this Blue Mountain structure. These are things that we've, we've uh, wished it was going to happen, and we've actually observed uh, the results. Uh, we see industry specialization across uh, the BD team. Uh, we've seen a general increase in number of agreements, in particular uh, non-exclusive licenses. Uh, engaging with a high number of principal investigators, as you can imagine, not every principal investigator is going to have a disclosure related to a therapy. Um, but if you're funded by the NIH and you're doing research, you know, there's a higher likelihood that you may have a research tool or maybe a diagnostic. Um, so there's, you know, consequently an increase uh, in internal customer satisfaction, increase in commercial engagement. Uh, and as, as Chris mentioned, um, you know, there's also startup opportunities. Um, and then the last slide that I want to show here is actually reflecting this, is what you see is the number of agreements. These are actually license agreements that you've seen per year in Mount Sinai. And what you see here in blue, not all these agreements are related to Blue Mountain, but, but we have seen a tremendous increase 
uh, and commercial related agreements uh, since the creation of Blue Mountain. And with that, um, I want to you know, see if there are some questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe, Chris, and Bill. That was very interesting. And thanks for uh, this overview of um, um, everything that uh, Mount Sinai Innovation Partners is involved in. Um, Joanne, would you like to go ahead with questions from the audience, or can I go ahead with my questions? Why don't you go? We do have some great questions from the audience. And please feel free to uh, enter questions. But Neha, why don't you go ahead with your questions? OK, thank you. Um, so I was uh, interested to know if um, you could tell us about um, how Mount Sinai is making sure that the scientists at Mount Sinai primarily understand the, the importance of commercialization. Um, I, I do understand that some people um, are more interested in publishing at higher journals and getting on with a more uh, defined um, solution of their research and they're not so much um, thinking about commercializing their technology they have in hand. So is Mount Sinai taking some steps, like some definite steps to encourage this? So I'll, I'll take that. This is Felipe. Um, this is a very good question. Um, and uh, obviously, like when I was a graduate student, I didn't think about patenting that much. I just mm -hmm. thought about publishing my work. Uh, but at Mount Sinai, um, so this will fall inside of engagement and education. And it comes not just from Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. So we have uh, road shows internally. Uh, we have office hours on campus. Uh, we try to uh, communicate with the postdoc executive committee society. Uh, mm -hmm. We have through our internship, we talk to we talk to the interns about the importance of you know if you if you have a great finding that is going to be published in Nature or Science or any high impact journal, you know maybe you have to think about you know is there any technology that uh, could be patented or a disclosure there that you might want to work uh, with a commercial partner. So uh, through our education component and our outreach and also actually all the way up to the top to the dean that, uh, you know, we make sure that the institution is aware, uh, the scientists mm -hmm. are aware of commercial opportunities to translate that science into products that could benefit society and, uh, you know, produce a return to the institution. Great. Thank you. Um, and I have one more question. Um, so I was wondering uh, what role does the tech transfer in general, and maybe you can talk about more in, in detail for your office. Uh, what role does it play in helping the decision uh, on building a startup or going in for a, a licensing deal to a big pharma, assuming that both possibilities exist for this particular technology, whatever it is, a device or a, a, um, a diagnostic tool? If there is a possibility for both, how, does, um, how do you take the initiative of, of talking to the scientists through it? So yeah, so um, that's, that's a very good question. Um, in general, our approach has been uh, that we are agnostic with regard was mentioned, I think, by Chris or, or Bill, we have a, a venture capital day. We interact a lot with angel investors, venture capitalists. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are opportunities that we also target for startup. And we think that you know that's the best route for that particular opportunity. In that case, we work with an investigator, uh, with a particular investigator on creating pitch decks, um, mm -hmm. talking to investors. Um, but uh, you know, essentially, once the company started, then uh, you know, we are, we are out, of, out of the picture. Um, but each case is uh, is its is its own case. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And Joanne, I'd like to ask one more, and then maybe we can go to the audience questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. Go on. Enjoy. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I just wanted to know. Um, maybe if you can tell us. I mean, you 
did touch briefly upon the various startups um, that, that have come out of Mansana and also uh, earlier I think um, Bill mentioned some of the technologies that are already have that already have licensing deals with these big pharma companies but I just wanted to know maybe one example that you could talk about um, maybe not in too much detail if that's um, that's against the policies but just a deal or a startup formation that you're most proud of, proud of and maybe a little details of why. Bill, you want to take that? Um, let me, uh, I don't know. I, why don't you take that, Felipe? I, I have some in mind. Let me, let me just give it some thought. Um, you want to start, Felipe? Chris? Yeah, maybe we'll come back to this question later. Uh, we'll think about this for a couple of minutes. We'll answer some of the other questions, and we'll try to get back to that. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, how about that, Niha? You stumped the band. Congratulations. <laughs> that's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, we have some very good questions here. Um, so uh, this, there's a, several people have asked this question in slightly different ways, and we'll consolidate it all. This one states it nicely. Does Blue Mountain uh, act as a clearinghouse for new technology from industry to flow into Mount Sinai for their use? Uh, that's a great question. It, it does happen every now and again, not quite a clearinghouse, but there, there are instances uh, where Mount Sinai wants to utilize technology from the outside world. Um, you know, that example happens in the genetics department or pathology department. Um, or, for example, we want to actually utilize a tool from some company, and in that situation we do actually uh, we are involved in negotiating in licenses for technologies, but that is that is rare. Um, you know, uh, if Mount Sinai is procuring um, uh, materials for use of the hospital, that's done through procurement, which is a completely different uh, group. And but then it's not really a license. So you know, just to differentiate the procurement of technologies that are used, let's say, in the clinical uh, uh, arena versus actually in licensing technologies that we may want to use uh, at Mount Sinai. So we'll have to we'll have to invite the procurement folks to speak at some point. I think that would be of <laughs> great interest. Absolutely. Um, I do yeah, I really appreciate this uh, very comprehensive uh, chat today. Uh, I mean, I have some more questions, but I just want to say it was really really intriguing. Um, here is from another person. Um, any specific challenges with imaging devices for healthcare applications? I assume they mean either IP or commercialization challenges. Imaging devices. Uh, the crowded, yes, yeah, so this is Chris, I'll answer that. So um, oftentimes it's the crowded space in and of itself that uh, poses one of the big challenges. Um, the the other challenge is if your institution has agreements with uh, particular scanning companies uh, and you utilize some of their equipment, um, there can be some some onerous terms uh, associated with the use of their equipment uh, in discovering your um, the, the utility of your device. So those are two things to think about. But in the end, um, there really needs to be clinical utility. So I went through the i program with a group last year on an imaging device, and we had a particular market segment that we felt you know, would utilize this device. And um, if, for those who don't know, the, the i program is a, a program that was started uh, by NSF and, and Steve Blank. And it's a program that essentially teaches you to get out of the building and interact with uh, 100 plus uh, different segments of the market. So consumers, buyers, manufacturers, payers, you know, all across the board and ask a lot of key questions to determine whether the product that you've come up with or the idea that you have uh, is valid. Uh, and it would be um, essentially adopted by somebody. So we went through this program with an imaging device, um, and we thought that this would be a clinical device, and through the program realized that clinicians really had no interest in using this. They just wanted to put a patient you know, into a scanner with a, a, a traditional phantom or a traditional device, just get a readout and move on. And having something that was higher resolution than that really wasn't of interest to them at the time. However, the researchers were interested in using this. And one of the difficulties was that the researchers actually built their own devices. So in terms of a market to sell to, that 
that, that presented a problem. So we're creating a device that's one device for all, but we found out that all the people we were going to sell to, well, they also created their own device and they had aspects of their devices that they preferred over this device. So overall, it presented a, a, a difficult uh, market opportunity. Um, for us. But going through that program was very beneficial and it saved us a lot of time and money in going ahead and developing the device without knowing whether or not there was a there there. So I would advise anyone that's thinking about starting a company or going out on an approach on their own uh, to try to find or get into a, a local innovation node for the i program. Ours is Nikron in New York. Hi, this is Bill Chang. I just want to add just a little bit to what Chris is saying. Um, from per, from experience, not from really Mount Sinai. I mean, I was working on a project in the, in the imaging contrast agents. Um, maybe it's because I'm a chemist and and we kind of like this type of stuff. Um, and first of all, Chris is absolutely right. It's it's a very crowded field, but in something like that, um, I really encourage people to think about if the regulatory issues before they go into you know, too deeply into it. And with something like imaging reagents, you have to inject it into somebody. And so the question is, you know, when you inject something into somebody, um, there's got to be all sorts of regulatory hurdles that you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to overcome. That means a lot of investment. And then at the end of the day, you got to go and really figure out what does your, tr you know, contrasting agent, what, how does it impact a clinical decision, a clinical a treatment, um, because that's going to drive whether somebody's going to buy it. Um, a lot of times what we encounter is that you know people think it's a really cool technology and therefore there must must be a market for it. And these are the questions that we struggle with all the time. So so that's what I encourage people to do. Yeah, there has to be a real cost savings, a real time savings, uh, or, or some other real benefit uh, in order for someone to adopt that over the currently existing technologies that's in that space. Oh, this is terrific. I'm going to take one more uh, of our audience questions, and then, Neha, I'm going to let you ask your question again, see if we can get an answer. Right? Um, sure. Let's see. It said, can you speak more uh, about biomarkers and signatures, further concepts of the microbiome, and trends and or research opportunities you see within this space? Yeah, um, so uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, biomarkers and, and signatures. So. Um, it's an interesting concept. I mean, um, um, we've had at least a couple of situations where uh, the biomarker work, you know, making into a biomarker as a diagnostic uh, was not actually done at Mount Sinai. So uh, we had a lot, of, you know, the the tangible property, the antibody itself, made at Mount Sinai, uh, not patented, and licensed out to research reagent companies. Um, and over the years. These antibodies were used. These couple, these two antibodies in particular, were used um, as research tools. They were published extensively, uh, and then a pathology group outside of Mount Sinai, in, in both situations, pathology groups outside of Mount Sinai, showed that uh, the antibodies could be uh, used uh, to distinguish, um, you know, a cancer uh, state uh, or uh, or stage uh, from another cancer stage or from for uh, normal tissue. And uh, because we are the owners of the, that technology, uh, you know, we were approached by, you know, passive, through, you know, through no actual active marketing of our own. We were contacted by diagnostic companies, saying, "Hey, it seems that you are the owner of this technology," um, and which is great. Uh, and uh, you know, it goes to show that if you have a gold standard research reagent, particularly in the field of oncology. Uh, that it can happen, you know, you can have that transition. And with regards to signatures, again, the one that uh, that comes to mind is a recent example of this 53 gene panel. Uh, it's the expression levels of um, uh, immunorelated genes uh, in melanoma. So essentially, uh, you can resect the melanoma, uh, and using a technology named NanoString, you can see if uh, if if your tumor is expressing high levels of these immunorelated genes. It seems that you have a lower chance of the of the tumor coming back, uh, and if the expression levels of these genes uh, are low, meaning your immune system is not attacking the tumor, then you have a higher chance 
uh, ovular melanoma coming back. Um, again, this is technology that's very exciting, but it's very expensive to take it to market because um, patenting is challenging, it requires approval, uh, and uh, you need to do several studies using a lot of uh, you know tissue samples. It's a it's a it's a a challenging project, but on the other hand, very exciting. So I hope I answered that question. Well, thank you. So Neha, would you like to ask your question again, and and then we'll ask her final comments, and we'll adjourn in a few minutes. Yeah, I have an answer for Neha. For, for Neha. I mean, I think that the part of the question is that, you know, it's meant to show, you know, what's your favorite, you know, I don't want to diss somebody's technology or, but one that comes to mind, sure. and I'm, and I'm going to say the reason why is because the executive that we have, we also have uh, 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 these positions called executive in residence or entrepreneur in residence. Uh, these are folks that, uh, that have had extensive experience in the commercial world and uh, we invite them to uh, sit in our meetings. Um, so one individual in particular, he's uh, a tremendous person. His name is Ron Lennox. Um, and uh, he licensed the technology from Mount Sinai and started a company named Amicus Therapeutics. Um, and it's, you know, the company is now a public company. Uh, and, uh, you know, it focuses on, on rare and orphan diseases uh, in the lysosomic storage space. Um, he does not yet have a product in the market, but, uh, you know, it's a, a product, you know, to treat Febreze disease. Uh, and it, the technology is very exciting. Uh, and, um, you know, because it is from our entrepreneur and resident, I would pick that as, as one example. But, you know, we, we, we even had examples of folks that, which is something that also happens, of folks that worked inside of Mount Sinai Innovation Partners uh, and left Mount Sinai Innovation Partners because they decided to actually be involved in startups uh, uh, from technologies licensed from Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. So for example, one example is Plexera. It's a company that uh, the chief executive officer at the time at least, uh, his name is Ivan Galan and he worked in our office. Um, and uh, you know, so there, there are a few examples like that, but I would say that um, one of the ones that I like the most is Amicus Therapeutics. Is, is the question a um, startup question or technology license question the best? Was that Actually, yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I'm, I meant any of the two, but just to know a little bit about, I mean, the why was yeah, just more, I, I, I can tell you, I mean, I, yeah, Amicus, I definitely agree with, with Felipe, and, mm -hmm. and I would put the, uh, the Farbazine, um license up there as well. Again, this is not a startup, but it, it, it may, you know, it's a product, it helps people. Um, with that license with Genzyme, it was done, I think, when Genzyme was a startup company, really, mm -hmm. and oh. it had tremendous impact on Genzyme and, and the trajectory of that company. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll put it up there as well. And, um, yeah, and then I, I have another one here, so in terms of license to a startup. So we had some compositions of matter, uh, which were um, basically compounds uh, that inhibited um, a tumor suppressor or activated tumor suppressor, PB2A. So we licensed these compounds to a company called Dual Therapeutics, which was a startup. They were funded by mm -hmm. a group. Uh, initial investors were Biomotive. Um, and earlier this year, BMS partnered the program. So this is you know has the potential to bring back um, about $250 million in milestones through development plus royalties on top. So a good example of, you know, getting uh, a program, you know, out of the building, get some independent investors involved and start driving the development and into clinical trials uh, outside of the institution uh, and then successful partnering with Big Pharma. So that was a good success story that just happened earlier this year. All right, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for the detailed answer. Great. Well, beautiful. Would um, would you like to go go around and make any final comments before we say goodbye today? Yeah, would you like to start? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for this time, and I think we had a really uh, good uh, um, insight into how Montana Innovation Partners works, and um, also some very exciting examples that I honestly didn't know of, and uh, I'm actually quite curious, and I'll probably read up more. <laughs> afterwards about this, but thank you so much for the time and I really appreciate um, you guys taking our time and doing this for us and our audience. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Okay, Felipe, would you like to say any final yeah, no, comments? You know, this has been a, a, a very good experience for us as well. We don't do many of these and uh, so um, 
I want to thank you for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to speak. Beautiful. And I can see from the list there are some people from some other interesting tech transfer offices, so I hope you'll all be encouraged to be part of these <laughs> programs in the future. Uh, Chris, would you like to make a comment? Uh, I just wanted to thank both of you for the invitation. So it was a, it was a pleasure to uh, have this opportunity. Um, we're very proud of uh, the Blue Mountain program here and look forward to its continued success. And if anybody has any additional questions about it, feel free to contact us. Beautiful. And Bill, I'm going to give you the final word. <laughs> I don't have much to say. I uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful holiday weekend. <laughs> And I second that. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll be sending out a note in a few days that the recording is available. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Take care. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.